something big is happening in generative AI. We're moving past simple chatbots and towards AI agents. So I flew 2,800 miles to go to GTC, NVIDIA's massive developer conference showcasing the latest AI innovations. And I got an exclusive inside scoop at some of NVIDIA's work in Agentic AI. I'm joined by Amanda Saunders, the Director of Enterprise AI Software Products at NVIDIA, who spent the last 10 years working on everything from graphics and data science to high-performance computing and now AI agents. And she shared some big insights about the future of large language models, self-driving cars, and of course, Agentic AI. Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. One of my first questions is just about Agentic AI. Um, you know, when I think about Agentic AI naively, I think about chatbots, I think about, you know, sort of customer service, but I got the sense over the course of this conference that Agentic AI is so much more than that. Can you give me a high level overview of how like NVIDIA sees Agentic AI? Absolutely. I mean, this has been 30 years in the making getting to Agentic AI, okay. so it's something we really care about and something we're really excited to see. Um, Agentic AI, for me, essentially, is um, AI assistants that are able to perceive the world around them, whether that's through data, through vision, through um, you know, images. They're able to reason about that data. They're able to think about it. They're able to process it. And then they're able to actually take action. So you mentioned a word that I think sometimes gets you know, sort of a, a bad rap, which is chatbots. Yeah. Agents are really taking these chatbots and making them effective and actually making them really useful. So let's start with perception. When I think of chatbots, right, separating, starting to separate them from agents, I think of a model that takes a text prompt in and provides a text prompt out, or a text output, right? Exactly. Um, when I think about other modalities like image, video, how do agents consume that data and what kind of, like, what kind of value and output do they produce? I mean, it, the outputs can be as diverse as the inputs, really. We can see lots of different agents coming in with different data types coming in and different data types being generated from that information. For me, video and image are some of the fastest growing data sources that we have in the world. Okay. Imagine how much video is being captured. That data is then being um, ingested and understood, translated into a language that you and I wouldn't understand, but computers understand deeply. Okay. That allows them to process, add context to that data, actually truly understand what's going on, and then they can output that into all sorts of different ways. Text is one of the ones that I'm really excited about because actually being able to understand videos in text language is actually a great way for humans to be able to digest a lot of video information. Sure. But it could also translate that into another video. It could actually uh, perceive and guess what the next step in a video might be. Okay. Uh, it could also create sort of a stylized video. There's sort of endless um, opportunities for what you can do with that kind of data. So would you say that an example of an AI agent could take in video and output, for example, in a self-driving car, actions that the car should take? It could, yeah, absolutely. Those are um, agentic actions. Um, I, I'm going to give an example because it's one that I love. Sure. I'm not sure if you've ever seen uh, Jensen got recently to throw out the first pitch at a baseball game. I did, yeah. So we took that video, we actually ran it through an AI agent, and we had it critique his form. <laughs> because we want him to get better, just in case he ever gets asked to do it That's again. That's right. How did he do? Uh, he did pretty well. And actually, the agent made a couple of uh, suggestions on the rotation so that he can get a little extra power. But other than that, I think he kind of nailed it. So yeah, let's actually, that's a great topic to dig into a little bit. So it's looking at video, it's probably looking at his pose, the speed of the ball, where the ball actually landed. And so, you know, in that example, we're talking about Jensen. Could one of those end users actually be a robot? So for example, learning from human video data but somehow teaching a robot to do it, or vice versa? Absolutely. That's 100% that's of what we do in Isaac Sim, is we can actually show them humans doing the tasks we want them to do. They can perceive that, translate it into robotic actions, and then act in the physical world. So there you're connecting digital agents to physical agents, and, and really sort of full circle, uh, closing the loop of the AI agentic world. Sure. We're talking about outputs that either humans or robots you know, things in the physical world can do. Are there agents that are just purely digital? So like, for example, an agent that just exists in a network to optimize network traffic or anything like that? Or has it always got an output that humans can see? Um, it doesn't always have to. There are absolutely some amazing things that are being done on the network side where we can actually simulate uh, network patterns and make recommendations on how to change them. Now, of course, could that agent go and take that action? Yeah. 
if it has that tool and capability, it can go act on itself. I think today, a lot of the agents we use, we like to keep humans in the loop on that sure. decision-making <laughs> process. Right. So a lot of those today tend to be the action that they take is to alert the human or to make the recommendation to the human. But absolutely in the future, we could see agents that are fully autonomous, that are interacting with other agents, and then are um, you know, taking actions on our behalf, maybe without us even knowing. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things throughout everything we've talked about so far is it seems like it's a zero shot input to output, right? So, you know, Jensen throws a ball, there's a critique. It's a one shot example based on a lot of training, I'm sure, to understand how to grade his score throwing the ball. But what happens if you give an agent a lot more reasoning capability, a lot more time to think, a lot more, um, you know, a lot more leeway in how it does the inference step? Absolutely. I think this is one of the most exciting things. Obviously, DeepSeek, which was a little bit earlier this year, came out and everyone went, wow, look at what this can do, because it was an open model that could do that kind of thinking and reasoning. Yeah. I think this is one of the really big things that um, application developers, people who are building these AI agents, have to work through. What is a reasoning question? When should I actually be reasoning and for how long? Yeah. And it's really going to depend on the requirements of whatever that use case is. So I think one of the things that we announced here at the show is a model we call Llama Nemotron. Okay. This model was based on Meta's Llama model, and we taught it to think. We taught it how to reason through problems. But we recognize there's a lot of problems you don't need to reason through, so we gave it that opportunity to turn it off. So if you're building an application and you get a query that comes through that's like, what is two plus two? Yeah. You probably don't need to reason about it. You can give a one-shot answer and the model will do that. But if you give it something more complex, like trying to figure out a complex seating dynamic, of course, then it's going to spend a little bit more time. Yeah. So I think that's been a really powerful uh, new capability that's now available in open models through Llama Nemotron that's going to help us start to answer some of those questions of how long should something be thinking. Sure. And so far, we've been talking about sort of one model at a time, right? But then there's also this, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the term, uh, Mixture, mixture of, of experts. experts. Thank yes. you. Mixture of experts is exactly what I'm going for. So how do you, like, is there a reasonable way to think about when we want one model or multiple models working together or one model supervising other models? How do you agents start working together? Yeah, this is, this is the topic we, we spend a lot of time with at GTC. So I think in general, there's, there's two different schools of thoughts. You train okay. bigger and bigger models that know more and more things that can operate independently. Yeah or you build more you know, specific and targeted models that know one or two specific tasks and then work together. I think both, mo both models are valid and they're both being used in different use cases. Okay. The domain specific or the task specific ones, I think are being used to create these sort of more complex um, processes and flows into these agents. And when you, sorry not to interrupt you, but like when you say that you mean one model might be way better at math, one might be way better at biology, but maybe they don't have a lot of expertise across a lot of different areas. Is that the right way to? Exactly. Maybe, or we were talking about data sources. Maybe one yeah. model's great at video, one model's great at text, one model's great at images. Got so it. Okay. There could, could be model, modality even. Okay. One model could be great at code. Yeah. There can be all sorts of different ways of doing this. And so for the people who are building that way, we actually recently introduced something called IQ. It's okay. spelled AI-Q pronounced IQ. <laughs> okay. There we go. Very intuitive. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, if you're, if you're an English major, it's, it, it, it you get it. Um, anyway, so we, we introduced this and what this does is it allows us to connect these different, uh, models, different agents, uh, different tasks or tool calling, um, that these agents might do so they can all work together. Okay. Cause we've talked about connecting models to build agents, but what about building age, connecting agents to build even bigger and more complex agents and to be okay. able to string together multiple tasks. So it's a really um, challenging problem, and we need to be able to not only orchestrate these agents, we need to allow them to communicate to each other no matter what framework they're built on. All of that is something we're bringing together in IQ. Wow. Okay, so it's it, like the agent, I'm starting to realize that the agentic AI space is much bigger than not just chatbots, right? But just any one modality or any one type of model. Um, 
what area of this field excites you the most right now? Like, what's the, what's the hard problem that's currently being tackled? Is it reasoning? Is it just stringing together? Is it stringing together many AI agents? What's the current like, landscape looking like? Can I say yes and? Yeah, yeah, yes and. <laughs> I, think, I think they're all challenging, and I think that's great. I think what I'm really excited about is watching how these different agents and these different models are being strung together. So things that we weren't thinking about maybe even six months ago, are now becoming possible. Uh, there was a great use case that I heard about here from our, from our telecom team, where we talked a little bit about network uh, agents and yeah. agents that could simulate. What these agents can do is they can actually look at an event, something like NVIDIA GTC, and they can say, we're gonna have a mass of people who are coming to this one area. What's that gonna do to the network? and they simulate 100 different scenarios that might happen. Yeah. And then they can make recommendations, and those recommendations can either be proactive or they can be um, reactive to the situation they're seeing, and they can literally make changes on the fly. To do that, you're connecting a network agent to a large language model agent to an agent that can actually speak to the different systems on these telecom, um, of these telecom providers. Yeah. You're, you're just connecting all sorts of pieces together, and that wasn't possible you know, even a couple of years ago. Sure, and that's going back to sort of, that's like a beautiful example of piecing everything together we've even talked about, right? Agents that take in different types of data, output different kinds of things, are experts in different areas of this incredibly hard, like multi-dimensional problem, working together, maybe not necessarily as a mixture of experts, but certainly expert models coordinating to output a, a final answer that humans can understand and take actions on, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah, so I think, and those, and there's hundreds of these, right? So we see them, you know, we talked a lot about the video space, which is one that I'm excited yeah. about. You know, in manufacturing organizations, they can input video, understand what people are doing in the factory, make recommendations. Maybe they've even got some robots in that factory. You can guide those robots and direct them to different pieces, uh, uh, different parts, depending on, you know, there's a, there's a spill on the floor. You've got to avoid this area. Um, they can watch everything that's going on around the robot, connect that to the information that the robot is seeing, and actually make these factories automate um, and, and work, you know, highly efficiently. Yeah. It's just, you know, again, these are things that, the more we get these models, these agents, into the hands of people who have complex problems, yeah. I think the more ingenious um, solutions we're kind of seeing come out of it. Sure. No, the, uh, I'd, I'd love to double click on that example for a little bit. You know, I know the big robotic factory example that's been showing off all the capabilities of Omniverse is something that we've seen for several years now. So at a high level, like that robot orchestrator that, that sort of optimizes the routes across multiple robots, making sure they're not getting each other's ways, but also controlling traffic flow, that could be an agent. Yes. Okay, and then the brain in each individual robot could also be an agent. Probably several. Okay, so, <laughs> so it's useful to think about like these agents, not just as digital AIs, but also physical AIs, and also physical to digital AIs. So it's like really any combination. It's like full on inception of agents. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> agents upon agents upon agents. Yeah. And again, and, and that's, that's sort of why generative AI has had this explosive effect on the world because it unlocked us from going to perceptive AI, which was incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, I mean, AI has been powerful for a long time, but by being able to generate um, being able to take you know historical information and generate brand new information that's never been created before God. and now to be able to reason and act on that data is just you know we're gonna see these things everywhere and it's why there's so much excitement around agentic AI and what it means for the computing world for accelerated computing and of course for humanity and what we're going to be able to do um, in our personal lives and our work lives yeah that's super exciting I, I have Two quick questions about that. So first, um, is that really where the line is between non-agentic AI and agentic AI? Is it the ability to reason or is it the ability to act? I think both are important. You okay. know, I think, I think really what, you know, again, the initial generative AI, we all tested it out, we all used it. It was, it was fun, it was useful, um, but it was just, you know, responding to the prompt. Right. I think giving it access to tools is what makes it actually reducing our work. So I know yeah. I use AI every day. I use AI agents, I use chatbots, and 
you know, when I first started using them, it was a lot of, I would prompt, I would get an answer back, I'd prompt again, I'd right. take the next step, I'd maybe point to a different agent and do that. Now today I can ask some pretty open-ended questions and a number of agents, uh, you know, a work stream of agents get kicked off and I'm no longer sort of the middleman having to, to keep yeah. everything moving forward. You're not the orchestrator anymore. Exactly. Like, yeah. The actual LLM is being an orchestrator and is devising that plan, is, is actually executing on it, yeah. and only coming back to me when it needs you know, additional information or next steps. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where productivity hopefully goes through the roof. Got it. That's awesome. Um, so, so far we've talked a lot about work, industrial, enterprise examples. But a lot of us, you know, we're not seeing that in our workplaces just yet. So what's an example of a personal application that an agent might do for us soon? I mean, uh, I'll, I'll use a very personal one, um, travel. Yeah. I, I, I work a lot. I try to make, make time to, you know, take a vacation here or there, but I don't always have time to plan it. Okay. So you can now use deep reasoning agents to say, hey, I'm looking for a trip. I want it to be relaxing. I want it to be somewhere warm. I ideally don't want to travel more than, you know, six hours on a plane. Yeah what would you recommend? And not only can it make you know, multiple recommendations, it can come up with itineraries, it can come up with recommendations, um, you know, it, could, it could probably even alert you know, your friends and family and see who wants to go with you uh, to find the latest tickets, yeah. you know, everything. So that for me is, is a big one um, because again, it's something that is important, but I don't always get to spend the time on it that I want to. And that, that's a really great example too because you know, there's you and then there's your family or anyone else you want to bring along. And so it starts becoming this sort of global optimization problem of who wants to do what, what do I know about who, how much time do we have, where are we going, how do I build like the optimum itinerary for everyone who's actually going in at once. So Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's 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 you know, it's supply chain management but of your family. Yeah. It's it's a very it's a very interesting and dynamic a problem. I've never heard before. <laughs> supply chain management but for your family. Yeah. Um, exactly. That's that's awesome. So like for people who want to learn more about agents, where can we go to like just do that? Learn more, explore? I think one of the, the best resources that NVIDIA has put out there uh, for enthusiasts, uh, for developers, for anybody who really wants to get started is what we call build.nvidia.com. Okay. Um, it is a, uh, you know, got all of the models there. You can go on, exper experience them through a UI. You can okay. actually test all the latest and greatest models. We have blueprints there, things like digital humans, things like PDF to podcast, taking data in and creating a podcast yeah. out of it. And if you then are so inclined, you can actually start developing right there. If you're, if you're comfortable with APIs, you've got API calls you can make right from there. Got so it. I recommend you check it out. So it's a, like agentic AI test bed where we can learn all about it, explore it, touch it, and then build one for ourselves if we wanted to. D and then download it and take it with you, yeah. That's awesome. I'm super excited to keep learning all about AI agents, uh, especially in the creator economy. It's becoming a very big deal, you know, so. Thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. A huge thank you to Amanda Saunders for explaining agentic AI, one-shot models versus reasoning models, and using multiple AI agents to solve complex problems. It turns out there's much more to AI agents than simple chatbots. Another big thank you to NVIDIA for inviting me to GTC again this year. And of course, thank you for watching and supporting the channel. Until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.